Okay, Monica, welcome. Hi, Henry. How are you going? Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Great. And uh, uh, the, the 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 hassles are, are providing lots of uh, um, content. So, uh, obviously, Jonathan um, earlier. Now, you to thank you so much and absolutely wonderful. And both of you got incredibly interesting things to talk about, which is why we we're keen to oh, keen to, to have you involved. Um, you're doing a, a section on the inner pharmacy. Um, uh, I'll bring your slides up and hand over Great. to you now. Yeah. Okay. So um, the way I like to start, I want to start off with a question. And this is for people that have ADHD or, you know, parents of kids with ADHD. If you had to define ADHD, then what would you say? This is the first question I ask my clients when I meet them. So they'll often say, oh, it feels like there's, you know, bees buzzing in your head or there's neon lights flashing in your head and you have to look at the lights. And this one particular person said she had bees and neon lights at the same time. So I can only imagine how distracting that would be. Um, some people say it's like walking around with your head in the, in the clouds or you feel so overwhelmed, you just feel completely blank. So that's how it feels, but that's not a great definition of what ADHD is. So by the time we finish tonight, I want everyone to have a really good working definition of ADHD as well. So as Henry said, uh, my topic is about to, how do we prescribe and dispense from our own internal pharmacy. And it's really about understanding the brain chemistry and hormones to support ADHD and great executive functioning. So uh, the objectives of this session is to describe some basic body and brain chemistry and get an understanding of how they work, um, explore how to dispense from this in this pharmacy for free and seven strategies that uh, make you know, for making important connections as well. So before we go any further, we're going to be on this slide for maybe about five minutes. So um, I was, uh, years ago, I was um, trying to explain ADHD to a deputy principal of a school and I was saying, well, this is the behaviours, but under them there is ADHD, you know, the executive functions and then there's brain chemistry. And I thought, oh, it's really a little bit like a volcano. So we're going to go through the different layers of ADHD to find out where this thing called executive function lives, if you don't already know. So at the top of the volcano, this is the stuff that either people with ADHD feel when they have ADHD or people around them will observe about them. And ADHD is very much, you know, behaviour-based diagnosis. So um, there might be those frequent arguments, um, miscommunication, being easily distracted, maybe focusing on the wrong things. There's a lot of procrastination and perfectionism at the same time. There can be lots of poor planning and missed appointments, catastrophizing or exaggerating. And I won't go through all of them, but there's just a little, little you know, handful of them. And when these things happen all the time, um, it's what psychology would call as impairing. But I prefer to say the word impactful. I like to try and keep my language as positive as possible because there's lots of positive attributes and of that ADHD as well. But for the moment, we're going to look at the, the tricky stuff. And when these behaviours happen all the time or they become impairing of, of the focus relationships, productivity, managing time, emotions, and memory. And, and these are really challenging behaviours. So when typically this happens, someone will go to their general practitioner, um, that's usually the first port of call or a psychologist, and to get a, an ADHD diagnosis, they will um, diagnose in these core symptoms of inattention, impulsivity, and hyperactivity. Um, but interestingly enough, um, you'll see a couple of other little volcanoes pop up at, at the same time. So I want to go back to ADHD though, but you know, when these behaviors become impactful or impairing, people might become anxious or even despondent or feel demoralized or had one academic say, oh, I'm disheartened. And you know what? That's a normal response to running late, you know, upsetting your friends, not handing, you know, um, uni work in a time and having to, to do another year at school or college. But that, being anxious or despondent about those ADHD behaviours is a normal response. And what happens sometimes is that people will have a missed diagnosis of ADHD and they'll be diagnosed with generalised anxiety disorder or major depressive disorder instead. So you'll see these two little volcanoes and each little volcano, one on the left, you know, represents the coexisting mood conditions and that is where generalised anxiety disorder and major depression autism spectrum, um, oppositional defiance, that's where they live. Um, and then there's another volcano on the other side I'll get to in a minute. But there's little saying in ADHD treatment that ADHD rarely travels alone. So yes, it can make you feel anxious. You may also have an general anxiety disorder. 
I want to talk about a little story that um, I had happened upon. Um, I work for a psychiatrist uh, sometimes and I do his adult intake sessions. And this lady came in um, for an, an, an assessment for ADHD and she said, you know what, I've been on three lots of antidepressants. I've, I've had seen four different GPs. The chaos is still there, but I just don't care about it anymore. And that really highlighted to me that, oh, you know, there we need to be able to differentiate between what is anxiousness because of the, you know, traits of ADHD and what's generalised anxiety dis disorder because the anti-anxiety medications and the antidepressants that she was on don't treat ADHD. So we need to be aware of, you know, what are the behaviours, what's ADHD and what is anxiety and depression, and they can travel together. I'm sure probably people have said that, um, you know, about 80% of people with ADHD will have at least one coexisting condition. About 60% of people have two or more coexisting conditions. So we have to be aware of, you know, these, these behaviours across people's experience. So on the other side, the other volcano, it's about the coexisting academic, and we need to be aware of these as well. So there are a lot of people, or a lot of kids and, and adults with ADHD might also have a condition called dyslexia, which is challenges processing symbols and numbers. And there's another one called dysgraphia, and that's about processing language. Um, we might see it in kids with really messy handwriting, and that's, again, processing language. We might see it in older students and learn uh, and, and people learning. They're not being able to get message out of their head and they might sit in front of a blank screen. They just can't get the message out. That's dysgraphia. That's processing language. There's another one called dyscalculia, which is the learning disability with maths. Um, coming back to the volcano, ADHD can certainly impact learning. So being, you know, chucked out of class because the person's too chatty, they're the class clown. I'm sure we've got a few class clowns here. Um, it might be about not handing work in, forgetting to do work, forgetting to take work, um, you know, all those sorts of things that can happen with ADHD. On the other side of the volcano is this, you know, this behaviour of self-medicating. I talk about people with ADHD might eat too much, they might drink too much, drink to excess, they might smoke or vape too much, or they, you know, also put screen time in here as well. So, uh, too much screen time. Th these types of behaviours talk, to, you know, really talk about uh, um, an understimulated brain. And if the brain doesn't, you know, able to be stimulated itself, it'll seek it from somewhere else. And that's a really important notion. So underneath here, as we dig a little bit deeper, is the layer of executive function. Now, I really like uh, using Dr. Russell Barclay's theory of executive function, and Barclay talks about seven executive functions. I divide them into four areas so my people can remember them better, but we get to all seven. So the first one I want to talk about, the first of the executive functions I want to talk about is self-awareness. Without self-awareness and attention, the rest kind of don't matter. So there's, you know, attention comes in three layers. There's people with ADHD might be easily distracted. They might alternatively hyper-focus on things and they might not be able to shift their attention when they need to, which is what makes transitions difficult. Uh, then we might go to inhibition on that volcano there. So and the inhibition is about um, uh, motor inhibition. So that's that fidgetis, fidgetiness, not being able to sit still, um, wanting to get up and do things. Um, then there's cognitive inhibition, and that is making the wrong decision, making impulsive decisions. So it might be um, speeding. It might be about over overspending, you know, too much online shopping. It might be about gambling. It might be about needing to do, um, you know, assessment piece for work or for, for uni, but accidentally watching the whole series of Friends instead, instead you know, on Netflix instead of doing their assessment, not being able to cognitively make a good decision. Um, in the moment. Um, and then the third one layer of inhibition is actually verbal inhibition. So I'd like to talk about, you know, people with ADHD might take a lot of words to answer a simple question. They go off on tangents. They might blurt things out. They might say the wrong things. They might overshare. So as you can see, we've already ticked off inattention, impulsivity and hyperactivity with our four executive function areas. We haven't even got to working memory or emotions as yet. And Russell Barkley, I think, says it the best. He says, to look at ADHD as just being, in, you know, easily distracted or impulsive is to trivialise the impact of ADHD. There's a lot more going on than that. Um, so I want to continue again with, you know, just having a quick overview of working memory. I like to talk about it to the memory that we're using while we're working, to that right now memory. And it's the only memory involved in our future success. And it encompasses time management and planning and problem solving. 
Um, and then there's emotions and motivation is the last area. And whereas something like depression is a, is a mood disorder, people are sad when they wake up, they're, they're sad at the party, and they can't get motivated. With ADHD, this they can be sad or they could be angry, um, but, you know, it's the, often the emotion is right, but the volume is wrong. So I'm going to say that again. With ADHD, the emotions can be right, but the volume is wrong, whether that's being happiness or enthusiasm or interest in something or someone gives you feedback, but you take it as criticism. Um, it could be about anger. It could be being, you know, more stressed. You know, the, the volume is often out of control and, and motivation as well. Sometimes you could be started, you know, start five things and be really motivated or sometimes it's really hard to get motivated at all that volume control can be wrong so there are the seven executive functions in a nutshell i'm going to move down a little bit further and underneath the these executive functions is the brain chemistry and the brain networks and the hormones and the neurotransmitters so you know things like medication can be really really helpful but diet sleep exercise and stress management are also key for impacting brain chemistry. And I tell you, there's nothing more, you know, changes brain chemistry more quickly than, than being under stress or pressure. So we get, this is where that volcano gets really interesting. Uh, at, at, at the base is that brain chemistry. If the brain chemistry is not right, that impacts the executive functioning. If the executive functions aren't working, this is why these behaviors here happen. So if I see any of these behaviors here happening, I know there's something in the executive functions that isn't supported. And unfortunately, the fallout from that can be guilt or shame or negative self-talk or low self-esteem or lots and lots of frustration. So that's why it's really important to figure out, well, where's the brain chemistry, how does it impact my executive function and, and the behaviours that everyone sees at the top. So my working definition of ADHD that I think is, you know, is quite a good one is that um, ADHD is challenges with self-regulation and it's self-regulation of these executive functions here. So this is just a little tool I've put together so my, my people can understand ADHD and executive functions better. Um, so um, I call this the framework. So, um, so when we think executive functions, I want people to be able to have a really good understanding of that as well. And it can be simply thought of as the, the cognitive. And anytime we see the word cognitive, it's just about thinking. So it's the thinking processes that guides our thoughts and our behaviours and they take place in the front part of our brain right there. So these processes guide our thoughts and behaviours. It's like having a little mental toolkit for moving forward and it, it's about heading towards what's next. It's about, you know, reaching our goals. So this is where I want to get into the neuroscience and, and the biology. So both are important. Um, we need to understand that the body and the brain are very much connected and they influence each other. So you're probably familiar with the sympathetic uh, response, which is that fight or flight response, which is a thing that we use for survival. And the opposite of that is the parasympathetic nervous system. That's the rest and digest and the calming part of the nervous system. These are both at play and they're both um, in opposition to each other. So, for example, when we recognise something that we find fearful, like an angry boss or an angry spouse or, or we feel in, under pressure, uh, there's a there's a little um, thing called the amygdala in our brain right in the middle of the limbic system and that's triggered. And that the amygdala looks for changes in the environment um, and it alerts the nervous system. So what happens then is stress hormones such as adrenaline and cortisol. Um, cortisol is, is found above our kidneys um, and uh, it can activate the flight or flight response in the cardiac system. So in the cardiac system, it increases our heart rate, our blood pressure and respiratory rate as well. So when the threat passes, we have this thing called top-down regulation. So our executive functions are able to reason with our body and say, hey, you know, it wasn't an intruder breaking in. My boss isn't really that mad with me. Everything's okay. I'm going to survive. So we literally breathe a sigh of relief. I think we've probably all been in those situations where we've been able to breathe a sigh of relief. And that's that parasympathetic nervous system kicking back in. And what generally happens is, you know, slowly our, our heart returns to, to more normal. It takes a while, but, you know, eventually our heart rate will come back down again. And then breathing is really important as well. We're going to breathe anyway. 
Uh, we breathe when we're asleep. We breathe when we're walking the dog. We don't even realize it. But we also have control of our breathing. And that's something I think that a lot of people don't realize. They have control over their breathing, um, which you know can impact this sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous system. So really, it's all about making connections. Um, the thing about ADHD, it's not um, a knowledge deficit, but it is a performance deficit. So it's always about the point of performance. We know we have reports to write. We know we have assessments to do. We know we have to pick kids up at the right time. All of the things that we know, but they don't always happen. So what we need to do is connect the knowing part of our brain to the doing. And this is my take on it. How do we do connect knowing and doing? We have to know about the resources, medications, sleep, exercise, for example, understanding those executive functions gives us the framework it helps us engineer the environment what you know at that point of performance and for me i think mindfulness is the next most important thing i honestly believe next to medication mindfulness is the next most important tool in the toolkit and i'll talk about that a little bit later so what does your internal pharmacy look like some people have a very old-fashioned pharmacy um, there's lots of stigma in there a bit of judgment um, they haven't got any, you know, any new processes going. Some people have a very cluttered internal pharmacy. They've got, you know, they're researching lots of things. They're trying lots of different types of um, strategies. But what I would like everyone to leave tonight with, which is a nice, clear, calm pharmacy uh, with, you know, really up-to-date knowledge. So let's dig into the, the chemicals now, just a quick revision. So too often I hear people say that dopamine is the woohoo chemical. It's just about reward. It's, it's more than that. It's also about anticipation. It's about moving forward. And dopamine is a, what we call the neuromodulator. And it allows the passage of signals through the nervous system. And it's involved um, not only in, in reward, but also in movement. It, it's involved in emotions and memory um, and the reward mechanism. Um, a, a couple of years ago now, I heard um, this fellow called Dr. Andrew Huberman, which I'm a huge fan of. And the very first, he's a neuroscientist, and the very first heard, thing I heard him say was, dopamine doesn't care about the deeper meaning. And I thought, oh, that's really interesting, particularly for my clients. And he said, it really just wants more dopamine. So that makes a lot of sense. So when we have our kids that we might think, well, you know, they can't have ADHD because they're able to concentrate on, you know, their their fortnight for you know two hours um, they're getting lots of dopamine which gives them lots of focus and lots of reward which you know impacts their emotions they're really happy to do it so anything that's contrasting to that that's not as interesting the dopamine won't follow dopamine doesn't care that they really should be having dinner with the family it just wants more dopamine so that's why shifting attention can be really really difficult for some people with ADHD and it's really about that pursuit and it's about anticipation of things beyond our skin um, which is opposite to serotonin. So we're going, I'm going to go th quickly through what other major neurochemicals and hormones are at play. I'm going to start with um, adrenaline, or, and it's also called um, epinephrine as well. And adrenaline is responsible for the fight or flight response. It allows more um, blood flow to the muscles and heart and lungs, and it's only released in stress. So we're going to dig a little bit deeper now. We're going to talk about noradrenaline or norepinephrine. Um, it's consistently circulating at low level. It's always there, but it responds to stress and it increases our heart rate and our blood pressure. It can impact mood uh, regulation, the ability to concentrate. It's there for arousal. Um, I think it's really you know, very much about pursuit as well. Um, then it's cortisol. So cortisol often gets a bad rap. Um, people think that um, it's just a, the stress chemical, but we actually it's actually responsible for alertness and we need it in the morning. We have most cortisol response in the morning when we're trying to wake up. It works in opposition to melatonin. So we need a certain amount of cortisol to wake up in the morning. Uh, we don't need it to be flooded through the day unnecessarily. So it, it's released um, to increase alertness when we perceived danger and it goes down when the danger um, subsides as well. So another um, brain, some more brain chemistry is about brain derived neurotropic factor and this is a protein produced inside ner nerve cells when active. So it stimulates and encourages uh, new, uh, new brain cell growth and can produce uh, new brain cells which means more connections so um, and more synapses. So 
I heard this um, little saying years ago, and I love it. It says, we learn by making connections. So if we can have new brain cell activity, we can, we can learn more. We also learn more by, you know, connecting with other people in our community, but we learn by making connections. Um, and then caffeine. It, caffeine isn't a naturally occurring um, chemical, but it is a molecule and it's significant when, when we ingest it because it impacts the absorption of other neurochemicals. So we're going to go on to a bit of serotonin now. Um, and this is a naturally occurring substance. It's a neurotransmitter and it carries, you know, signals between cells. It helps with mood regulation, memory and sleep. Um, and then oxytocin. It's a hormone and a neurotransmitter. Um, it's involved in bonding, empathy, trust, sexual activity, relationships and building. It, when a woman has a child, their body is absolutely flooded with oxytocin. And I can tell you, as a mum, that minute that child is born, you would die for that child. This, you have this response that is quite fierce. Um, and then it's useful in regulating emotional responses and positive communication. And then melatonin. So melatonin is a hormone in your brain uh, that produces a um, response to that darkness, uh, sleep, wake, circadian rhythm cycle. Um, so we need melatonin to be secreted so that we can fall asleep at night the flip side of that in the morning we have um, cortisol release so we can wake up so it's important to understand those two so now i want to dig a little bit deeper and going to these opposing forces so things like serotonin and oxytocin they're um, what uh, lieberman and long uh, framed as the here and now chemicals so we get pleasure from this and sensation from when serotonin and oxytocin are released. Um, on the flip side, dopamine gives us pleasure from anticipation. And in most circumstances, they counter each other. So when the here and now chemicals are activated, we experience the world around us um, and the dopamine is suppressed. When dopamine is activated, we want to move to future possibilities and the here and now chemicals, they're, they're repressed a little bit. So why is this important? Can understanding this, the body and brain chemicals impact our relationship? The answer is absolutely yes, and I think we all need to be really aware of them. I'm going to do a little, little case study. So here's Hamish. Hamish has had a really busy day and his job in the marketing department. In fact, the last meeting ran late. Now he is running late for his football game. So he was supposed to be home you know, at, at 5 o'clock. It's 5.30. He's racing to get to the game. He is driven by dopamine and a bit of epinephrine as well. Um, here is his partner, Mandy. She's had a lovely day. They had a, a retreat for the day and she did an hour of yoga and she did a lovely values exercise that she cannot wait to tell Hamish about the minute he gets home. So she is driven by serotonin and she's in the here and now. And there can be clashes when this biochemistry is in opposition. You know, what could go wrong? Poor Hamish doesn't know what he's coming in for and, and Mandy isn't ready for him, you know, barreling into home wanting to get out to play football. She wants to connect. So now I want to go into, well, what can influence the internal pharmacy? So what are the actions and what is the science behind it? So I talk about the big seven. So um, nutrition, hydration, sleep, uh, exercise, breath work, mindfulness, um, self-reflection, uh, stress reduction, and connection. And what I love about this, these ones are free. These don't even cost us anything, aside from maybe if we have to buy, buy a new pair of, you know, running shoes. These cost nothing. The only thing we really have to buy is, is you know, food and water. So I came up with um, the notion of we have an internal pharmacy, like a bit of a script pad. So I'm going to go through. So these are the things that we need from the pharmacy. And these are the really, really simple actions that we can do to prescribe and dispense from it. And under here, everything is free. You know, most of these are freely available to us. So I'm going to start off with nutrition. And you know what, nutrition can be really challenging for people with ADHD. Um, it's that planning, that challenge with the executive function of planning. So a lot of people will have a reduction in appetite when their medications are on board and then they might even binge eat when, that, when the effect of the medication's worn off and they overeat. Um, overeating can be a challenge if, you know, particularly if it's not treated. They might make incorrect food choices, that working memory, if I eat this now, it's not gonna be good for my future. Um, they can get cravings. So we really need to make, you know, a, a good effort about those nutritional building blocks, you know, foods that are, are rich in magnesium and, and tyrosine. We, we, when people have ADHD medications, uh, they're not dopamine. 
or we can't eat dopamine, but we can eat foods that help with the processing and the building of or creation of dopamine within our bodies. So things like chicken and almonds and avocados, my favourite on here is chocolate. Hooray, we can eat chocolate and knowing that it's helpful to produce our dopamine. Um, things like oatmeal, watermelon, wheat germ. And there's a, there's a really great um, YouTube video um, and I've just got a uh, reference there that I would recommend if you want to find out more about nutrition and, and neurochemistry, I would highly recommend that. The next one is sleep and rest. And for some reason, um, we seem to think that sleep is one thing we can cut down on. And really, it's number two on the internal pharmacy prescription sheet. It's the next most important thing we can do. So when we, sl when we sleep, it helps create new synapses or connections between brace brain cells. Um, as when we sleep, it actually has a process of detoxifying the brain and re removing unwanted cell, um, cell debris. It's called the glymphatic system, and it works two to three times faster when we're asleep. So we need that. If we don't have that, that's why we wake up groggy the next day and it's harder to you know, ma manage our decision-making. Um, you know, so there's sleep is one thing. We all know seven to nine hours is ideal. Um, there's also another concept that of non-sleep deep rest. It's called NSDR as well. Um, this might be what we call, you know, having a power nap. Um, this week I've decided I'm gonna, not going to call it a power nap anymore. I'm going to call it my reboot. And uh, even if during the day, if I can have 10 minutes just to shut my brain down, much like we would a computer that's been overloaded, it can make a huge difference. And some people say, oh, but I can't fall asleep through the day. You don't need to fall asleep in that, in that power nap or the reboot. Um, there's a thing called yoga nidra, um, and this is like a body scan. You're not meant to fall asleep. And that, this is a uh, no, great strategy to have through the day. When we're walking around, our beta waves are um, uh, activated. When we do something like yoga nidra, um, we go into alpha waves, and that's, that's when our brain slows down. Um, we can be have a relaxed awareness without paying attention. And when we're in that state, more serotonin is released and that keeps us calm. So sleeping at night is really important. Um, and even like a power nap or a reboot through the day can, can make a lot of difference. We don't want to be going any more, I would say, than, than 40 minutes. We don't want to upset our circadian rhythms. You wouldn't have a two or three hour nap at, you know, 6 p.m. in the afternoon or the evening. That would really wreck your sleep in the evening. But, you know, being able to be strategic with sleep and rebooting um, can be really, really helpful. Um, exercise. Um, it's even better for our brain than it is for our body. So, um, Exercise can improve physical, cognitive, and emotional physical functioning. Um, it impacts the neurotransmitters. Um, physical exercise can increase the levels of norepinephrine, um, dopamine, and serotonin in the prefrontal cortex and other brain regions. And again, um, BDNF, which is brain-derived neurotropic factors, it's a protein that, that helps create new um, brain cells and new um, connections as well, um, and it can help with learning and behavior. Now, breathing and breath work, like I said right at the top, we, we probably don't appreciate how breathing and breath work is. Like I said, it's the first thing we do when we come into this world and it's the last thing we do before we leave. So it's really very important. It bookends our life. Um, so if we can understand it better, you know, it's a great advantage for us. Um, so understanding um, the body and brain chemistry um, when we when we go into that fight, flight or freeze response, um, our breathing is impacted. So here's a couple of great strategies. I particularly like, I actually love box breathing, and that's a little strategy where you breathe in for four seconds, you hold that for four seconds, you exhale for four seconds, and this is the funny bit, then you hold that for four seconds, and we're kind of not used to doing that holding thing. But um, it's really, really impactful. If we do four or five rounds of that, we can sort of have a, an immediate impact on our, um, our breathing and therefore our heart rate. Um, and the Navy SEALs, the US Special Forces, they use box breathing as a strategy. So if it's good enough for them, there's science behind it, it's good enough for me, and I know it works. I have lots of clients that we've talked about it and have used it in difficult situations, and it has made a huge impact. Um, there's another one called 478 breathing. I actually prefer box breathing because I just think the maths is easier. Um, it can be used in stress. So these strategies can be used when we're stressed, when we're feeling stress, but they can also be practiced outside of that stressful situation. So this is when if we can, you know, what we practice grows stronger. So if we can practice box breathing or 478 breathing outside of the situation, when we do need to use it, we'll be a lot better at it. So I would typically encourage my people if they're going to do a minute of mindfulness, you know, do some box breathing while you're doing that. 
So ultimately, when we can control our breathing, we can better control our thinking. So how do we do that on the whole? You know, as we walk around, um, we're often breathing as a society. We're probably breathing a lot more than what we need to. Um, there's some little simple things that we can do. We can slow the rate of our breathing, you know, mindfully. We can do this by inhaling more deeply, taking notice of that. We can also do it by exhaling more deeply um, or even longer exhales. So it's really simple strategies that we can do. Next one is mindfulness meditation. And like I said earlier, um, I really think that mindfulness is the next most important thing to medication. Um, so the first one is being more conscious of, in the current moment. And mindfulness allows us to be object, objective of our thoughts and not caught up in them. So particularly if we can be mindful of our thoughts in a non-judgmental way, have some self-compassion. So instead of being, um, you know, being triggered by something and saying, oh, I'm really anxious, we could take a step breath and back and think, I'm noticing that I'm feeling fidgety. I'm, I'm noticing that I'm, my breathing is getting faster. So, you know, it gives us, it's, it's the wedge for awareness. Um, we want to watch for negative self-talk as well. Because um, words, I always say to my clients, words have a lot of power, whether we say them to ourselves or someone else says them to us. We want to be watching for that response and seeing what our, what our brain is telling us to do. Um, and then when we're able to pay attention to our thoughts, our, our attentional um, networks and our emotional networks, they both can't be in charge. So if we're able to notice our emotions and turn on our attention, we can be more attentive in the moment and therefore make better decisions. And one of my, I have a friend about 30 years ago had told me this saying, and it was a bit of a sleeper for me. It took me a while to sort of really process it, but I understand it a lot better now. The saying goes, it's better to do nothing than to waste time. And if you're like me, you probably thought, well, isn't doing nothing wasting time? But it's not. Um, we can get caught up in a lot of time-wasting behaviours such as doom scrolling or gossiping or just, you know, drifting off into space or whatever, whatever. But, um, you know, it's if we can have some time of bringing our attention to the current moment and, and being very intentional, doing nothing, um, we can you know, have a much better experience moving forwards. Then human connection. Uh, Dr. Ned Hallowell, he's um, a psychiatrist in the US. Um, he talks about um, connection is the new vitamin C. Um, when when um, we can, you know, stimulate oxytocin and uh, serotonin, that those are the here and now chemicals, um, and you can do something as simple as a six-second hug, you know, of course, when it's appropriate. And that six-second hug is known to produce more oxytocin, which is that bonding chemical as well. So stress management um, and self-reflection, uh, also on the internal pharmacy, something like journaling. So you might be writing about three new things, like a gratitude exercise, noticing three new things every day that you're grateful for. Because when we learn to do that, our brain starts to get rewired for looking for positive things in the environment as opposed to defaulting to the negative and being on alert and being ready to go into fight or flight. So this is a great way of rewiring our brain. Uh, the next thing is planning. So I know a lot of people that I work with, they say, I don't like to plan. Um, they, they, they think that other people without ADHD actually don't plan. They actually do. Um, or they might say, um, I don't know how I'm going to feel then. I had one lady say, I don't like planning because my plans mock me. And you can see the emotions in that. I had another guy said, oh, my plans don't mock me, they judge me. Um, so, you know, what we want to do is get better at it and we want to, you know, when we plan it, it takes a load off that working memory, which is one of those executive functions. So um, we want to declutter that working memory. And when we when we do, uh, you know, according, when we're doing, you know, things like self-reflection and goal setting, we're actually creating some optimism in our brain and that stimulates dopamine and that's about pursuit and moving forwards so i always say to my clients it's much easier to hit a target if we can see it if we have ideas in our brain of things we want to do we can't see that we can't see inside our brain but if we can externalize it then we can see it and then we can hit that target and we can pursue it and can feel good about what we're doing now it'd be remiss um, to not talk about how the impact of hormones and women um, is part of the ADHD experience. So changes in hormones can impact women across the lifespan. So it can um, 
start at puberty, adolescence. It then changes in adulthood. It changes in pregnancy. It then changes again in perimenopause and, and menopause as well. So this is why, you know, for some women with ADHD, some weeks are better than others. And this is because um, estrogen in the first couple of weeks is a cycle. Um, it's plentiful and serotonin and dopamine travel with, with estrogen. So the first two weeks are okay, things to, tend to go okay. Then over the next two weeks, things tend to get a bit harder as the estrogen decreases, progesterone increases, which means that less estrogen means there's less dopamine available. Um, and I've had many women say to me, look, my medications don't even feel like they're working right now. It can be that significant. Um, and further to that, some years can be better than others as well. So um, estrogen levels drop by about 65% um, after about the age of 51 when menopause occurs. So um, it starts gradually dropping over the next 10 years. Um, and then that reduced estrogen again causes lower ser serotonin, lower dopamine availability to the brain. As I said before, less estrogen equals less dopamine. It also equals less serotonin. When there's less serotonin, serotonin is a building block for melatonin, which means that sleep is also interrupted, um, which is difficult. So um, now this next slide is called promoting and preserve, preserving the neurochemistry. Now, I'm not going to, there's a lot of on this slide, so I'm just going to go flick through this pretty quickly. But we have the ability to promote dopamine availability with, you know, taking medications, diet, sleep and exercise. Um, it's also about motivation. If we're motivated to do something, we set that the target, we can be optimistic about it. That creates dopamine availability. Um, we can also, on the flip side, preserve the dopamine that we have. So that might be simple things like shifting time, do, you know, doing some mindfulness, having a break from something, simplifying tasks, breaking them down. Um, there's, there's hundreds of things that we can do to preserve our natural occurring dopamine. You know, time management, mind mapping, monitoring, delegating. Um, a lot of people with ADHD tend to be people pleasers. I'd say, yes, I can do it. But then it's hard with it. They don't plan how they're going to do it and then they get stressed. Um, it's setting alarms. So as we start to, to put this all together and to wind down, I just want to recap the 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 significance of ADHD and executive functioning. So our executive functions, there are cognitive or thinking processes. They take place primarily in the front part of our brain and our executive functions guide our thoughts and our behaviours and our brain chemistry impacts the accessibility to our executive functions. So again, I just wanted to show, you know, I have, I've created a little script pad. I would love to see the script pad on every general practitioner, every psychiatrist, uh, every psychologist, um, coach, OTs, anyone that talks to people about their mental health. Um, as um, non-medical practitioners, we can't prescribe medications, of course, but everyone pr can prescribe these really simple things from our internal pharmacy. So here they are in that rank order that I went through before. You know, particularly nutrition, hydration, when people are on ADHD medications, um, they need to in ensure that they're well hydrated because they can be very dehydrating. It's regular, well-planned meals, two, two meals a day with three different colours of nutrients can make a huge difference. Um, early sun exposure, getting to sleep on time, exercise, breath work. Um, and when I have this little, uh, my little model here, I leave a couple of extra boxes and that's not because I've run out of ideas. Um, it's because I want people to put in um, their own actions that might help them with their own body and brain chemistry or give them that joy. So a good example could be music or art or meeting up with friends. So there are lots of things that we can do. Um, and I know, I understand at the moment that an accessibility to medications is difficult in the UK. So in the absence of that, I would never, ever say this is instead of. Always use, you know, go with what your, your medical practitioner is saying. Medications as prescribed are really important. In the absence of that or supplementary to that is that internal pharmacy. So in as we finish up, when we understand our body and brain chemistry, we have the keys to our internal pharmacy. And I really love this uh, quote from Deepak Chopra says, the brain is an instrument at the service of the mind. You are much more in charge of your biology than you think. So that's it for me. Um, this is who we are. Um, 
happy to ask any questions, uh, answer any questions. Um, and you know, sort of things that we do is work with individuals, families, high schools, schools, workplaces. As you know, John does couples. He works with uni students. And um, I'm also talking at the um, US conference. My topic there is how do I tell my kids I have ADHD, which is often a big conversation as well. So I thank you for that, Henry. And thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to talk about my internal pharmacy at this conference. Uh, no, I can't hear you. Oh, I've done it again. Like every section so far. I had someone message me saying Mike overspill. It caused me into wild panic. Um, particularly, frankly, because I had just gone to the loo. <laughs> and I had a horrifying feeling that uh, uh, everyone had, uh, well, accompanied me. <laughs> and, um, uh, they then said, no, it was me. I think they had another tab playing by mistake. So like, oh my gosh. Um, there's... Um, some wonderful comments coming in uh, uh, over the chats. Um, um, Monica is a, 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 just a brilliant coach, uh, which is just nice uh, uh, um, just to, to see um, in this saying, um, I love this talk. I find it so overwhelming. It's just too good to be true. It's hard to imagine what control feels like. What do you have to say to someone in that? Place? It's hard to imagine what control feels like. I mean, I, I guess that could partly be, you know, when do they get, a diagnosis of ADHD. I mean, sometimes if people have had a, an early diagnosis, they, they might have some awareness of this, but the later diagnosis, you don't know what's been going on, you know, so it's all been a little bit of a mystery. So um, that's where mindfulness is so important. You know, I always say to my clients, whatever's happened in the past is good information. You know, we want to move ahead with the best neurochemistry, the best awareness, the best understanding of executive function. So... Um, the only moment we have is one in the present. This, this lovely question, who is this lady? This is uh, brilliant. I need to find this you. video later. Someone replied to Monica Hassel, um, well, international coach. You coach people across the across the world and uh, present on ADHD. Across I listen the to world. a lot of podcasts um, when I do my walk in the morning. So <laughs> a lot of good information. Um, uh, and the video you will be able to find later, it's going to be on YouTube. Um, yeah. uh, so uh, it, it will be there for you. Um, uh, I'm just checking the questions. If you've got any questions, do put them into the um, into our um, uh, chat matrix. Uh, if you go through to um, uh, the Q&A um, platform, go to globaladhd.com. Uh, you'll find there's um, uh, a place to... Uh, uh, and I'm going to put it into the chat. You'll find there's a place to add questions. Um, please do that. And um, uh, right, so we've got some questions for you, which have been put there. Well done. Who did that? We do. We I do try and pull questions from the chat as we've just done. Oh, great. But the chat, like what other people won't know, and well, I can't do two things at once. So I know, like it's very dangerous. Uh, um, uh, what a lot of people don't know is that. Um, uh, uh, the chat that we see is consolidated between YouTube, Facebook, and LinkedIn. Uh, and uh, there's a lot going on. <laughs> um, uh, and so we do, it can get lost in the stream. So do try and put it into, um, uh, 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 into the, into the, into the platform. Uh, and I do need to do a shout out for donations. Please consider donating. Um, so the only way we can do this, when Monica is donating her time, uh, none of our speakers are paid. They all do it out of love and wanting to help and change the world for people with ADHD. And Monica, we're very grateful for your time. You're, and she's actually on holiday right now, but she, uh, uh, um, you know, we're so happy to be, you know, I feel um, like my job is to curate good information to people. I don't do any clinical studies, but I like to curate good information for people and hopefully, you know, make some models to make it easier to understand. I mean, that's a good definition of good coaching right there. <laughs> like, um, and uh, just one, just one testament to you that you've, you've got that. Right. How much do you feel nature, uh, um, particularly genetics, and nurture factor into neurochem uh, neurochemistry and rewiring the brain? Is it possible for any, everyone to benefit from this techniques or do some people require additional support? Uh, more time well it's kind of a big question but um i think what's good for people with adhd is good for everyone anyway so i mean there's obviously you know people if they're um not brought up in a family that values good nutrition that's going to impact 
your your habits. A lot of this is about habits as well. Um, we know that um, you know ADHD is genetically uh, there's un- underpinned genetically, um, so there's going to be some part of this. But it is also about the environment. Um, in fact, there's a there's a model that we didn't show tonight because we couldn't show everything. But you know, this is what impacts performance. There is what's happening in your brain impacts your performance, your ability to access your executive functions, the environment, the people in your environment. Um, but also you learnt behaviours as well. So they can impact um, your performance. And remember, ADHD is about the point of performance. Um, and that's why I, I talk about those executive functions being the framework. Um, and Barclay puts this beautifully, talks about if we can't do it all in here, we have to engineer the environment. So, um, you know, and create strategies that help us get outside. You know, that green time is really important for many, many reasons. Exercise helps us breathe. You know, if I go for a morning walk in the morning, I just don't go for a walk. I listen to podcasts while I'm learning. I'm taking pictures of beautiful things and sending them to my daughters and, you know, communicating that way. I'm doing... Um, I'm doing tricep dips. I'm, I look crazy when I go for a walk. You wouldn't want to come for a walk with me because you'd be stopping doing tricep dips and learning things. And I stop and do my mindfulness while I'm on my my walk as well. So um, I, I do a whole lot of things. So um, it's it's about you know habit stacking as well. Um, a lot of uh, what we talk about is is just sort of good habits, but it's remembering to do them. That's where working memory comes into play and planning them and making time real. So. That's probably. I hope I've answered the question. Uh, no, I think like you've got. To, now you you made the ter- terrific mistake of mentioning podcasts, and you've got an inevitable question, <laughs> which is, are there some you recommend? Oh, absolutely. Um, ADHD Experts podcast that's uh, created by. Um, oh, I can't remember the organization in the US, but it's it's fantastic. Um, there is uh, the neuroscientist Andrew Huberman that I spoke about. I heard him initially on um, not a, a neuroscience podcast at all. It's like a business podcast. But Andrew Huberman now has his own podcast series and it's based in it's neuroscience based and it is fantastic. He has actually done a couple of episodes on ADHD. He didn't really talk about executive functioning, um, but that's not his specialty. But he, he has fantastic episodes on how to set up your environment focus. Um, so Andrew Huberman podcast i highly recommend that um adhd experts highly recommend that um doc uh the, um brendan mahan in the u.s um john and i've both been on his podcast it's called adhd essentials uh, and i'm ho- hoping to make my own podcast later this year i've got to plan that so um yeah there's lots of good information out there and it's free what i love about podcasts is that you don't have to sit down and read a whole book you can get a lot of good information in about an hour um so, you know, and audiobooks too, that's another great way to, to process information. Um, the question is, can you share your slides? They just come in front. Um, so I'm not sure about that. Yeah, no, um, yeah sorry, I'm trying to read the chat. And yeah, no, you have to share slide. your your, sli- your your slides afterwards. Oh, um, yes, yes, I'm happy to share my slides afterwards. Perfect. So we'll, we'll put them up onto the, um, we already have them, because uh, we always have a plan A, B strategy on slides. Navy SEALs uh, always have a plan uh, B. Uh, and plan A being that people can share them with us, um, because then they get to control them, and plan B being that I do it, and we all get to relive COVID days with next slide, please. And uh, I have ADHD, so my attention wanders, and I'm not very good at it. <laughs> And I have to be reminded. <laughs> it's, uh, it's not a good place. Uh, the, um, uh, um, I think that's it. We're out of time. Uh, it's, uh, uh, you've been absolutely wonderful. I found that a fascinating hour. Thank you so, so much. Oh, thank you um, for having us. John and I love talking about ADHD. We can't stop talking about it, in fact. So, um, yeah. Uh, but, yeah, thank you so uh, much. No, well, look, thank you for, yeah, you've broken your holiday to do this. You're an incredible um, uh, inspiration and interest and uh, your idea of your focus on curating great knowledge is a wonderful thing. Uh, the you. comments coming through are absolutely lovely. Like, you know, as I've put some of them up, but uh, just had thank you for such a great talk. And um, uh, I, I did put them up. So if you rewatch, it was actually partly for you. So when you rewatch, you'll be able to see all those wonderful comments coming in. That's thank it. Goodbye. So thank you so much. And that's our final link with Australia, I think. So thank you very much. And uh, um, yeah, hopefully see you next time. Um, goodbye. Thank you.